when we were considering the ground we might cover in today's comments, um, I think uh, you would agree with me that 15 months ago, no one could possibly have foreseen the Ukraine war, unless you're some lunatic in on um, goings on inside the Kremlin. And I, I don't think any of us fall in that category. But it is the truth that it has dominated our thinking uh, economically on a massive scale for this period. And uh, I have myself had the opportunity to uh, liaise with, for instance, uh, my friend Tom Hayes, uh, the man who's awaiting to be found uh, innocent of all charges in the libel rigging scandal. And he is well informed as to how matters are going on in terminal markets. When I said terminal markets, I mean uh, indices, commodities, you name it. And um, funnily enough, I've done really quite well um, in this area. Uh, I'm normally rather skeptical about climbing into currencies or climbing out of them. But the fact is that um, here was an opportunity to try. And I have tried and it's made me a lot of money. And I hope this continues. Unfortunately, I can't think in terms of forecasting. These matters arise at short notice and um, have to be acted upon there and then. They can't be, um, they can't sort of be held in abeyance while uh, readers gather their margin money or whatever. The fact is that uh, one has to uh, act on them when they arise. So if I allude to uh, terminal markets, uh, please forgive me. I don't think it constitutes much help as regards thinking to the future. Anyway, what I thought I would do, it's quite important, is to consider what I've been doing on my family's portfolios uh, this last year. And uh, that has been very instructive. Um, for instance, uh, one of the things I've been doing is buying shares, uh, which are perfectly good, but which are delisting as a result of the management taking the view that being listed on AIM implies costs of compliance, which are disproportionate to any economic advantage of the companies in question, uh, which, I, which is quite understandable. For instance, one of the companies that uh, readers uh, or followers will recall is Caribbean Investment Holdings. And I always thought this was a cheap share. And indeed, for one member of my family, I paid 10 pence a share. And a year or two later, we all received a five pence dividend. So it's fair to say that for this first and lucky member uh, of the family, the net cost of the involvement in um, Caribbean is five pence a share. Anyway, as followers will know, um, this Caribbean has been updated by uh, takeover by Michael Lord Ashcroft's uh, holding company, Waterloo Investment Holdings. And the terms, which are all settled and dealt with, and the shares have all been distributed, was one and a quarter Waterloo investment holdings for each one of Caribbean investment holdings. 
And I think that that's a real price in the sense that um, both companies are entirely solvent or were entirely solvent. They're now just one company. And they were controlled entirely by Lord Ashcroft. So uh, there's no question of any jiggery pokery here. It's just a question of his tidying up his holdings. As you know, he's a very rich man indeed. I don't think that he does this just because he got out of some bed in the morning and decides to have some cornflakes with magic mushrooms or anything like that. No, he's a chap who thinks ahead. Anyway, the result is the family now has uh, something like 2 million shares in Waterloo Investment Holdings. Um, and uh, the question is, what are they worth now? Well, um, I think it can be argued that they're worth 50 to 60 pence per share, which, for instance, returning to them from my family who paid 5p net is a pretty good return. The problem, of course, is that one cannot sell these Waterloo investment holdings uh, holdings because they are unquoted. And uh, why well, I say they're unquoted, they are theoretically quoted on the Bermuda Stock Exchange, but there is no uh, market there at all. There's no job I'm prepared to take a position on but at any level. They won't just take, um, they won't even take 5,000 pounds worth. Whereas as I think I've indicated to you, Family Corkwell's holdings are worth a great deal more than £5,000. Anyway, I don't think I really want to sell them. The fact is the businesses comprised in Waterloo are going well. And in due course, I expect there'll be a tidy up bid. And as a result, um, the, uh, it, it's reasonable to expect that um, uh, there will be a good return on capital. Of course, the return will be enhanced by the absence of compliance fees, save those expended at the Bermuda Stock Exchange. <laughs> I don't like dealing, the idea of dealing with the Bermuda Stock Exchange. It means transferring stock into a registration that's acceptable the Bermuda Stock Exchange and then placing the order and goodness knows what happens then. I, I have no idea and I, I don't wish to try it either. Anyway, the, that's a very good example of an unquoted stock. There is, as Waterloo itself points out, uh, an, a possibility of trading Waterloo through J.P. Jenkins. And um, J.P. Jenkins, uh, as older followers will know, it, it used to be a market maker in this country. Uh, and then it got overtook, overtaken by Brian Winterflood, whereas Winterflood is a, is a huge operation now, part of Close Brothers. Um, J.P. Jenkins sits there very quietly doing very little. The problem is that to trade through J.P. Jenkins, you have to ask your broker to offer shares um, at J.P. Jenkins and or, or wait for uh, someone to come and uh, buy your stock from you. Well, that might never happen. I mean, I think it, it very probably won't happen. And uh, furthermore, we don't know how much profit J.P. Jenkins takes between the bid and the offer. It, it, it might be 10p, it might be 20p, I simply don't know. And J.P. Jenkins refused to let one know, and, and therefore I say, well, if we can't agree on what uh, the terms of trade are, I don't see any point of try in trying to trade. And I think most people would say, yes, well, that's understandable. That's what an unlisted investment means. It, it, unquoted investment means. It is, it just, you just have to put up with whatever happens as events move along. Anyway, 
Uh, I don't regret this policy because uh, I bought, for instance, Shaw Capital, uh, where the Shaw brothers had decided to withdraw from quotation. Uh, and I bought them for, as it happens, my uh, elder daughter. And um, that has paid a pretty handsome dividend. Uh, again, it's unquoted. Uh, and I tried to pick up some more stock and wrote to Howard Shaw asking for uh, details of those who wish to sell. And unsurprisingly, I, I, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't reply since, of course, he would rather buy any loose stock himself. <laughs> I mean, Shaw Capital, insofar as brokers are doing well, uh, are doing well. And uh, they've got some very intelligent people there. And um, the business is going along. Uh, indeed, uh, I, I, of course, I don't know just how well these brokers are doing. For instance, as you will notice, Sencos and FinCap uh, announced a merger last week. And um, uh, it's, they're both clearly, at least in stock market terms, much reduced operations. Um, I can see the merger works. It's, it, it means sharing common overheads, and that's always a good idea, other things being equal. And I can see that the merger might have been the only way to make sense of the difficult um, circumstances which they had to confront. Um, I myself suppose that they also <laughs> might become unquoted. And I think there's something in the brokerage uh, vein, which says, oh, well, we'll, um, we, we'll stay quoted because that's our business being quoted. But as a, as matters stand, volumes are so light these days and showing no signs of getting better. One does rather wonder what the point is. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Um, it, it's just those are the circumstances in which we live. But elsewhere, um, I turn to a long uh, established subject of mine, which is investment trusts. Well, we have, of course, at Master Investor, the contributions by Nick Sudbury, who knows his way around quoted investments, investment trusts, and very interesting stuff he had produces too. And uh, I just feel that it's a great pity that the private investor cannot anywhere get a proper service to investment trusts. They are undoubtedly the, the vehicle for the, for the long-term investor. And funnily enough, They've become more so uh, under the new uh, government because the personal allowance for capital gains tax, which is in the order of 12,000 pounds as we speak, has been halved in 23, 24 to 6,000 and then halved again in 24, 25 to 3,000. And, um, this means that the great advantage of having one's own portfolio outside an investment trust means that one, one, one was able uh, to take a profit uh, free of tax, but now the, the tax-free allowance is, is in prospect, a pretty slight affair. And as a result, people will just go on holding shares rather than selling on pure tax grounds. And uh, although I hasten to remind followers that um, Sir James Goldsmith always used to say that he who sells, who invests or sells to save tax will shortly have no tax problems. <laughs> anyway, the fact is that I still think investment trusts are a sensible way uh, for people to take a long-term view of investments. 
because an investment trust, if it is run properly by the management, um, uh, is comprised of, with managers who take great care in selecting the, their chosen constituents for their portfolio, particularly in smaller investment trusts, i.e. those capitalized at, say, 200 million pounds or something like that. And uh, in this regard, uh, I have covered over this last year uh, New Star Investment Trust, which is the most interesting uh, construction. Uh, when uh, John Duffield and my friend Alan Miller departed uh, Jupiter, they formed New Star. And uh, for uh, one of the constructions there of this fund management group uh, was New Star Investment Trust, ticker code NSI. And John Duffield put a lot of, uh, of his personal money uh, into New Star, which is capitalized from memory, it's about 150 million, something like that. And he's got about 70% of this equity. Uh, it's beneficially for him and his family. Uh, but it's uh, managed by Brompton Asset Management, which is his uh, management arm, which he's kept going uh, after the, 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 the denouement of New Star and it's disappearing to Henderson. Anyway, the fact is that um, the shares are cautiously managed and um, John Duffield, who controls the show, uh, is not prepared to have his personal wealth uh, handle on anything other than a long-term basis. Unfortunately, um, we don't live forever on this planet. And uh, as a result, uh, as we get closer and closer to his death, uh, there are no signs of anything being done to narrow the gap between the share price, which is currently about 120, 122 pence, and uh, the true net asset value. What this net asset value is, I don't know, but I should think it would have to be at least 180p as we speak. And that means that at an appropriate moment, it will be possible to close this discount simply by selling constituent parts uh, of uh, the trust holdings and then using the cash to buy in the shares uh, in issue in New Star. And of course, the only person who can affect this improvement in affairs is John Duffield. <laughs> and if he doesn't feel like it, why should he? He's, he controls it and he, he just wants it run economically. He's not interested in a short-term solution. He'd rather the shares that are held through New Star be handled properly for the longer term. So for cautious long-term investors, um, I think family of Corkle got about 500,000 pounds invested. Um, they, they just have to sit there uh, and wait to see what happens. I think that's a perfectly sensible approach to investment. And as a result, um, I, 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 for those who got patience, uh, New Stars, NSI strikes me as a good investment. You don't have to worry about it. You just got to wait. You could, but you, you, you may have to wait a very long time, that's all. I mean, obviously, on his death, uh, John Duffield's death, the thing will move. But as to where that is, I, I don't know. Perhaps um, I will predecease him. <laughs> so then one would take it from there. There's been another development in this last uh, few months, and that is 
uh, the nature of long-term funds held, for instance, in uh, self-invested personal pensions or SIPs. Um, because the, 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 the background to uh, SIPs has been absurdly favorable uh, economically uh, because of the tax regime. And, uh, and as a result, in recent years, uh, HM Treasury has tried, and not just tried, it has reduced uh, the amount that can be held in fund uh, simply uh, before the higher rates of tax are incurred in, in withdrawing money from the fund. Well, when one thinks the whole idea of a SIP was to try and spread uh, a drawing on a fund over into one's old age when one is presumably not earning, then uh, as, as a result, people would have just have uh, been deterred. And now we have this extremely funny result that uh, the doctors have been <laughs> retiring because they don't see any point in working for nothing. Well, I, th I, I rather agree with them. I don't see why one should work for nothing. And the fact is that uh, so the government has uh, just, uh, Jeremy under Jeremy Hunt, has uh, just hugely removed all limits to the pension fund. Of course, uh, that's perfectly sensible. Uh, if, it, if one wants to inspire the economy, why this benefit, uh, as some argue, should be restricted to doctors, I don't know. I think one could argue pretty cogently for all sorts of other trades. So as a result, I, I don't think that's a great problem, although some have foreseen that it will be. And uh, one has to wonder what a Labour government would do. Well, we're back to exact, <coughs> exactly where we were which is what is the test uh, in the economy if those constraints are reimposed? And they will be, the, the effects will be unfavorable. So although I'm not impressed by the intellectual abilities of the front, of, um, the shadow uh, government, shadow cabinet, I think they will see reason and they won't uh, reimpose the limits. Now, I think it's wise to, to proceed on that basis. Where uh, there has been another change is that at least with an ISA, there is, investors know where they are. And they put their money into the ISA and uh, sit there in their chosen vehicles uh, for the duration. When I say the duration, I'm talking about years and years. In fact, I'm inclined to think that it's wise to build a SIP up to say half a million pounds, but don't put any more than, into it than that. Uh, because although inflation will take up the fund, it, it, one doesn't know how far <coughs> the <coughs> inflation will run over say the next 10, 20 years. And nor does one know what uh, political regime will be faced. So I think there's a compromise to be done. One should just have 500,000 pounds as a limit there. But I think if one really uh, wants to take the matter seriously, one should consider emigrating because uh, this country is, I'm afraid, going back to the socialist lunacy um, in the late 70s which I observed when a younger man. And um, if you, I mean, some will not remember, but uh, the rate, top rate of tax under Labour was 98%. Um, and they, they imposed this rate of tax because they wanted to show who were the masters regards distributing uh, investors' money. But of course, it didn't have that effect. A lot of um, people who were successful in their chosen trade simply emigrated. 
And I don't blame them. 98% tax, there is no point. There were others who took other routes. For instance, there was a, a lot of taxation avoidance through various expensive, I hasten to add, taxation avoidance specialists. And uh, in the end, that blew up uh, in the mid 80s uh, when the House of Lords, uh, as it then was, the Supreme Court as it is now, uh, simply blew that out of the water uh, through artificial uh, transactions. I may add that all these schemes revolve around uh, limited companies controlled by the, uh, the taxation avoider in, in question. Uh, and that's based, the conduct of this company was based on uh, board meetings. Well, the, the taxation avoidance specialists purported to have board meetings when closer inquiry showed that the meetings can never have occurred since the directors in question were uh, traveling abroad or whatever. Uh, so you can imagine there was a tremendous song and dance about that. Um, anyway, I hope those days do not recur, but I fear we're heading to something comparably silly under Labour. It'll never work, and uh, we'll just have to see what happens. And anyway, I, I come back to, to the ISA as, as an instrument for saving. Um, I think there is a case uh, for concentrating on ISAs, even though uh, they are funded only out of uh, net of tax income. And as a result, um, uh, they, they're not very attractive in the short term. It's just that as, as matters stand, they lend a degree of certainty, which I think investors should uh, be drawn to. Uh, and I've gone a stage further in that uh, my wife and I have four grandchildren and we have put aside this last uh, three years or so, um, 9,000 pounds per tax year into a junior ISA. And I think that's quite a good wheeze too. Of course, uh, it's not done for free. There is a, uh, one is choosing long-term investments, which, um, can be left there without switching around because the costs are very high in a small portfolio uh, in relation to uh, the, the size of the portfolio. And uh, the, the, the junior risers that uh, we have assembled um, uh, are, have the further restraint <laughs> I can put it to you that way, but that is they really are the property of the grandchildren in question and irreversibly so. And then when the grandchildren are 18, uh, that those portfolios, those funds become the property of that child. And that's irreversible too. Uh, and uh, some people are concerned about that because they'd like to control uh, their grandchildren's behavior on attaining the age of 18. And if they seek such a control, they need to approach, take, have a different vehicle. And it's got to be, uh, you've got to use trusts and so on. Well, trusts are expensive. But I, I'm quite sympathetic to people who wish to control their grandchildren's uh, expenditure of their funds, because there are these small problems of, uh, in, with wayward children, there are the small problems of drugs and driving a Ferrari down the embankment at 100 miles an hour at two in the morning. Well, that's all very well, but that's how grandchildren get killed and it has happened too. I can remember a member of the Guinness family about 60 years ago did exactly that. And I expect 
the Guinness family would have reflected that they'd like to have stopped the boy in question from expending money the way that he did. But there you are, you, you liberate an individual, uh, and uh, he's an individual, and he goes ahead and does it. And, you know, one has got to be a strike of balance in between. Probably involves using a, a solicitor or something like that. Uh, even then, the control is by no means perfect, that must be said. Which indeed brings me to another point. Um, as I think followers, and master investor followers know, uh, I and my wife have, still have a very small uh, taxation practice. And of late, uh, we have had to deal with the affairs of a taxpayer who has turned to dementia. Well, she had no control over that turn. But unfortunately, uh, she had not arranged for a proper economic control of her affairs um, in advance of her turning to dementia. And of course, she cannot now understand what it is that she might do. Uh, she doesn't, it, it, it wouldn't be a binding contract to, for anybody because she just, she is non-capex. And as a result, um, it's produced a very expensive mess of um, lawyers' fees with the result that, um, uh, with the result that I don't wish that result upon anybody. Indeed, I think, uh, it, it, one of the things that have been going through my mind is that it is a great pity that uh, property, which really ought to be uh, properly insured and managed, uh, has not been, as far as I can tell. Although I think the, the general plan is back on track, there really was no guarantee that there would be. And I think that's something which people need to think about. Uh, well in advance of, of the problem arising. Anyway, um, what one must do is avoid the staggering fees charged by lawyers, because, you know, the, the money just evaporates on that basis. And um, I think we've done our best in the case uh, which I've just described or alluded to, but I, I don't think uh, it's how um, things should be done. I think it's for the taxpayer to work out in advance the moment he thinks that there's a deterioration in his condition on the way, he should do something about arranging the lasting power of attorney, attorney uh, rather than leaving it until um, later. Not everybody has the good sense to, to do that. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, we've had some uh, disappointments in the last year. And for instance, I seem to have acquired no less than three uh, uh, holding oil shares, which um, in each one I invested about 50,000 pounds. And in each case, uh, the money simply disappeared, not through fraud, but just they just didn't find the oil that they, I had hoped that they would. And that's been rather disappointing. Um, but anyway, nothing venture, nothing gain. And um, I keep on going for the big hit in the belief that that's the way forward. Um, I slightly over it in that I, for instance, I bought for the family 5 million shares in Amigo Holdings, the uh, guarantor lender company originally established by James Benamor, uh, on the grounds that I did not think that the courts could be so stupid as to arrange society's relations uh, to Amigo. Um, in such a way that Amiga itself went bust. 
But astonishingly, the delays caused by the courts has killed off a me. Um, I'm very sorry about that. And um, there's nothing to be done. It's just a uh, case of how the law so helpfully destroys wealth. It does that quite often. It, no, no one seems to mind, really. But personally, I think it's a pity. Um, there's nothing wrong with guarantor loans. It's not very attractive. Um, but it's a way of extending finance, uh, which sort of enables the borrower to get finance which he or she desperately, desperately requires, where someone known to the borrower can bring some sort of pressure to bear uh, upon the borrower. However, the reality is that the law requires not merely that the borrower receives proper advice before borrowing, but also the guarantor receives a review of his or her affairs before the guarantee is acceptable to make the debt against the name of the borrower recoverable. Well, I expect that uh, when James Benamore set up Amigo. He did so in the belief that uh, the guarantors would be uh, honourable and meet their obligations. But of course they haven't, I'm sorry to say, mainly because they've been told not to by various friendly, so to speak, forces. And uh, the result is an absolutely king-size mess. Um, where all this leads to, I don't know. Uh, at least Amigo was working on 50% APR, whereas I see on the telly that there's, uh, there's a, someone, I think, who call themselves Everyday Loans or something like that. They, they're charging 99% per annum APR, which, of course, is, is very, very destructive of any borrower's chances of getting on top of his or her affairs uh, economically. Anyway, one of the shares I have held for, as, as followers know, uh, which I, one of the shares I've held for a long time have been uh, REA Holdings, uh, which uh, is a plantation company in Indonesia. And uh, for some time, the price of palm oil, its own product, um, was rather depressed. And then the price of palm oil, palm oil started to improve. And as a result, the Indonesian government stepped in and uh, imposed a great levy uh, upon the export of palm oil. Well, this is all very well, but... This is very much a case of heads I win, tails you lose um, on the part of the Indonesian government. And I, I, under those circumstances, I would normally have ducked away from so, such a, a treatment. On the other hand, uh, I think there's some evidence that the, uh, that the Indonesian government regret this and they have uh, realized that such a plan on their part will simply cause the plantations not to be maximized to, to the advantage of anybody. Uh, and so as a result, they have eased off their levy. And um, this has attracted uh, my friends at uh, OD Asset Management to come in and, and take a stake. At this stage, it's only about 5% of the ordinaries. And I think the ordinaries are probably the way in because the prefs uh, have no equitable upside. And of course, they require the profits to pay dividends on the downside. Uh, however, they are paying off their arrears of prefs, and I think we should get the rest of the arrears of the prefs 
uh, at the 30th of June, 2023, which is what, uh, three months away now. Uh, and that'll be nine pence a share. You can buy the press at around 90p, something like that. So strictly speaking, on the basis that they're 9% cumulative prefs, uh, th that will be a yield of around 10% per annum, which I think is quite attractive these days, and uh, notwithstanding the inflation, and notwithstanding uh, higher rates of interest on long bonds. Anyway, um, that of course, that's a judgment call. If I were merely slavishly inclined to follow another, I would um, I, I would follow in uh, only asset management. But instead of buying the press, I'd buy the ordinaries, and I think that's a good investment. And they're around one pound ten pence now, or something like that. Uh, and you don't have to buy them aggressively. You, you buy them, tuck them away and see what they, things come to. Turning elsewhere, uh, again, this is an unquoted investment. And that, this is Watchstone Group, which is the um, new name for, well, new, it's been around for a year or two now, the new name for Quindell, that appalling, scam, uh, which has now been tidied up mercifully, and it's just a question of waiting until various litigations have been sorted out. Uh, I, th I would think Watchstone Group is probably a fair bet at around 25p, but you can only get them on the Aquis Exchange. And uh, some people say, they say, well, I refuse to deal on the Aquis Exchange. And we'll, I'm just going to uh, we'll leave that alone. I sympathize with that. It's a perfectly reasonable attitude. But it's uh, for those who prepare to lock up uh, capital for a long time. And I may add uh, that, for instance, my elder daughter's SIP is something she won't draw upon for perhaps another 20 years. And uh, therefore, one, in that portfolio, one can take a long-term view. And that's exactly what uh, I've done on her holding of Watchstone. I'm hoping that with a bit of luck, these shares, as I say, currently 25p, <coughs> could easily double. But again, uh, there's no guarantee attaching to that. Anyway, elsewhere, uh, another interesting company, which uh, has come across my desk, is uh, Scolium Group, uh, S-C-H-O-L-I-U-M. And I always thought that that was going to be a terrific buy once inflation took off, um, which I thought it was certain to do. And it, but unfortunately, it hasn't caused uh, private investors to turn up at Scolium's headquarters in the West End and buy rare books uh, as an inflation hedge. They haven't. Equally, I can't bring myself to sell the holding in Scolium, but I think somehow, somewhere, uh, sometime, the, the shares are going to pop up closer to net asset value, which is now about 70p, uh, as against the current share price, which is about 35p. And um, so I, I think I'm quite happy to stay with that. Uh, <laughs> elsewhere, um, there's uh, the chairman, Jim Mellon's company, uh, Webis, W-E-B-I-S, ticket code W-E-B, hanging around. And here are the... Uh, the boss, Ed Cummins, came by here, I don't know, about six weeks ago, and we discussed Webis. And although it's capitalized at around £8 million or something like that, uh, uh, and the, the net tangible assets are a tiny fraction of that, 
uh, it's also true to say that uh, one day the Americans are going to let sports betting be much more extensively uh, legalized than it is at the moment. And I think Webers will probably succeed. For instance, uh, the, uh, the Webers did a deal with Frank Stronach, uh, who's a, a big investor in race courses. He controls a lot of them in America. And two well-known courses are Santa Anita and Gulfstream. Santa Anita is, of course, over on the West Coast, and uh, Gulfstream is in Florida. But these are big operations. And Webbis is in there uh, such that Webbis's punters can, over the internet, bet on Frank Stronach's courses. And I would have thought this is going to succeed. Furthermore, I suspect that Webbis is going to make f further investments uh, in race courses, which will be standalone investments to join its uh, harness racing uh, investment uh, back in California, in Sacramento. And I think that could work. Um, at least I certainly hope so. I know that Jim has been carefully waiting to see what happens there, but he, he can't uh, do much about it, short of getting interested in betting, which I don't think he is, and um, going to America, which also I don't think he wants to either. He's very happy being ensconced in the Isle of Man. And as a result, uh, I don't think he'll be departing anytime soon. Webbers are now about 2p. I don't know uh, how, well, how long it goes to buy them. You can't buy more than, say, a quarter of a million or half a million, no more than that. So whatever uh, policy decision is taken in relation to Webbers, it will have to be followed up cautiously. And uh, perhaps it will come off. Uh, <laughs> what is also striking is, um, as I look through one of the family portfolios, uh, is the oil shares portfolio, which struck me as very sensibly constructed by me. And uh, unfortunately, they have um, been very disappointing. But at one stage, they were doing very well. I rather share the view that we're not going to be free of fossil fuels for a very long time. And therefore, we may as well, I say we, I mean, Britain may as well just get on with those investments it has and, and we'll see what happens. And I'm not sure the rest of the, uh, the tree hugger fraternity, uh, well, how they want to get to make of that conservatism. Where I do think there is an astonishing opportunity is in the chairman's Manx Financial Group, which is ticker code MFX, which I bought extensively at 8p uh, some years ago, and was then very surprised that nothing happened. But I think the fear was that with lockdown, it, there might be widespread bad debts as people simply refused to pay for their car loans and, and that was that. But it didn't happen. And as a result, MFX has emerged in a strong condition, this side of lockdown. And I think we'll go on um, doing well. For instance, um, uh, although Jim is not... Uh, He's described as executive chairman. Uh, the fact is that Denamique uh, knows the business very well. And everywhere one looks around the portfolio of MFX, uh, things are coming along very successfully. They, on the basis of the results announced uh, a couple of weeks ago, the shares uh, advanced very sharply. And I, I wouldn't expect uh, the, the shares to go ahead 
sharply for, say, the next three months or six months. But I think they will, because quite clearly, uh, the net assets have, are supportive of the current position. And uh, the price earnings ratio is emerging is quite attractive. I'm not sure what it is, but I wouldn't think it's more than six, and it may be dropping. And furthermore, there's a dividend, which of course, the absence of which uh, inhibited the appeal of the shares um, for a long time. Of course, one understands it from the management's point of view. To pay a dividend, you remove vital capital to expand the business. And, and since at all the time, all the time that they have held the dividend back, the business has uh, been going very well. So paying out a dividend is not a particularly wise approach. Anyway, the fact is they have um, uh, done that to good advantage. Um, I won't go on about Logistics Development Group, LDG. I still think they're about 15 pence. I still think that's ridiculously cheap. And it is so because although the overt upside is not much, there is really no downside on, say, a um, three-year view. And I think that's pretty attractive for most investors. At least they are where I've come from, i.e., you can't lose, but you can make. I think that's rather a good idea. Um, well, uh, we might have gone wrong is angle, which uh, looked to have a means of diagnosing cancer and getting a biopsy uh, much more cheaply than any other system. But so far, that has not uh, turned to the advantage of investors in Angle. Indeed, I suspect that a lot of money is going to have to be spent somehow before things improve there. There have been other disappointments as the uh, as events have collapsed. Palatro uh, has been a disaster. And uh, it looked so encouraging, but the reality is that it hasn't turned out to be, and I don't think it ever will be. Whether one would sell them down here at 6p, I, mean, I hasten to add, I did pay 60p, so <laughs> that wasn't very clever on my part. But uh, the fact is, I, I don't want to sell Palatra here. There might be some residual value accumulating to shareholders. And I um, propose to stick with that. Uh, elsewhere, uh, I've had the disappointment uh, over in Bangladesh that although the, the board of uh, Beximco, BXP, uh, Beximco Pharmaceuticals, I isn't to it, uh, have put aside the money to pay a dividend the authorities there won't let Bexinco buy US dollars to pay the dividend. <laughs> so it's, it's rather odd. I would say I would have thought they'd be wiser to buy the uh, foreign exchange first uh, with the permission of the authorities and then announce the dividend rather than the other way around. But that we have to look at. Would I sell them down here? They're now about 43 pence. Um, I couldn't possibly bring myself to do that, since it seems to me the company is well managed and it is doing extremely well. But it, it is a problem, you know. The shares continue to be comfortably under half uh, as costly uh, here as they are in Bangladesh. So, so one would imagine that uh, some bright spark within the authorities at, uh, in Bangladesh would allow Beximco to buy in its own capital uh, over here. But for some reason that hasn't happened yet. I think that's a mistake on the part of the Bangladeshi authorities. 
and I hope they think better of it in due course. That's all I would say about um, family investments, which is what, of course, I've had to live with this last year, as indeed we all do, where we are lucky enough to have investments delineated to the family. But um, I would just now return to my favorite subject uh, on us, uh, which is not, as many of you will say, sex. I'm too old for that. The fact is that uh, it's short selling, uh, which can be extremely exciting. And here, things really become extremely difficult. It's quite impossible to buy, uh, to take out short positions, because you can't in the smaller stocks, which is where the opportunities arise, because all the uh, routes to this insist that one must be able to borrow the stock, which is fine, but there is no market, and there won't be any market. Uh, for instance, I see this morning uh, the Scottish Gold plays, uh, SGZ, have uh, uh, collapsed in price, and I must say it does look as if a geological uh, difficulty has arisen for this uh, company. And uh, it, it really doesn't matter how much money they raise, they're looking at it they had for 15 million pounds, which is a lot of money for a little company like this. Uh, but it looks to me as if there will be no particular profit for shorters there. And of course, as I say, one can't borrow the stock anyway. Um, but you know, that's how it is nowadays. It didn't used to be before the regulators got involved. But anyway, there it is. Elsewhere in the world of shorting, uh, Tesla has proved to be very irritating as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure we'll get there in the end, but it's taking much longer than I ever thought necessary. The fact is the share price is way, way, way ahead of events. It's just that um, the American retail investor has taken it upon himself to see that the share price continues to be way, way ahead of events and nothing will deter him. So there we're stuck. Where do we go from here um, in the coming year? I simply don't know. I'm fearful uh, that, that Ukraine could uh, engage us in war somewhere along the line. Uh, I hope it doesn't come to that. And there's some sensible people around to stop our involvement. Certainly, Sunak is not a fool. Indeed, I think his performance to date has been faultless. Uh, but the reality is that events can happen on the build up to war. And uh, as a result, there is no uh, happy means of acquiring certainty. It just doesn't happen. So with that rather gloomy uh, prognosis, uh, I wish you all well for the rest of 2023 and possibly 2024. <laughs> I don't know. But I have little else to add, which I think must be said. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs>